Good morning all. Welcome to today's PMTV broadcast. Um, I'm really delighted with some of the feedback you've given us on PMTV so far. Um, so we're going to stick to our principles and try and keep things cheerful, happy and hopefully uh, informative. Um, a little bit of admin to start with. Uh, there's no planned fire drills. So if the alarm goes off, kids are probably cooking something they shouldn't be, in which case you're free to leave us. Uh, once you've done that, though, please do like PMTV on LinkedIn um, and any other social media. Uh, if you want to be kept up to date with future broadcasts, as well as to be able to replay all of our previous broadcasts. This broadcast is live. There is a chat facility, so we'd welcome any questions that you want to ask us, and we'll, we'll endeavour to get around uh, to answering them um, uh, during the half hour that we're on. Um, my wonderful colleague Hannah is also on hand to help with any technical challenges you have, um, so please feel free to use that chat function for either purpose. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, we are recording this broadcast and then we're releasing it on YouTube. And um, so we try not to identify you by name to avoid them having to ask everyone's permission to do that, uh, to, put it, to put it on YouTube. The chat content is not shared in the YouTube version. Um, on the YouTube channel, you can find about a dozen past episodes or more. Um, if you want to listen to Amy Bell on compliance or Claire Fanner on marketing in tough times, or watch Rob Halston and Michael Day spar on the future, residential conveyancing market then please do go and peruse at your leisure right now today's conversation is all around technology and why it is so important not only to the future of law firms but actually suddenly in the running of them today as well so i'm delighted to be joined by rupert collins white uh, rupert is director at burlington media and crucially he's the person behind the excellent legal practice management publication um, Bennington and the legal practice management lead the way in understanding how law firms are implementing or planning to implement technology in their businesses. Um, and they report on that through their annual legal IT landscapes report. If you've not read this report, you're going to get a little, little taster, um, but do get in touch because I'm sure somebody can get your copy. And it's a really interesting survey of law firms' uh, own view of they are planning use technology or they're using technology already. So Rupert, welcome. Hi there Jay, thank you very much. And perhaps I can start off by asking you to highlight some of the key trends that you that you found in a recent report. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, uh, Legal Practice Management magazine uh, is actually a, sort of a, a digital um, uh, and uh, events business. So we run research uh, publications uh, and a conference every year. Um, and we do a heck of a lot of polling across those. It is um, uh, aimed at UK law firms um, with revenues from roughly 750,000 to a million a year up to about 19, 20 million a year. So thousands of law firms come under our remit. Um, and one of the big uh, pieces of research that we do every year is called Legal IT Landscapes, comes under our research area called Frontiers. Um, and that, it looks into the intersection between technology and business strategy in law firms. In other words, we're trying to understand how technology relates to um, the real business uh, world of, of doing law. Uh, usually those relate to sort of three or four key areas around efficiency and productivity, um, competitiveness, uh, and response to market drivers. Um, because obviously technology isn't something that law firms do. Uh, delivery of legal services is what law firms do. So we are concerned about how technology relates to that and how, uh, how well it can deli uh, how well it deliver uh, on what the law firms are trying to achieve. They're, you know, they don't, they're, not, they're not tech businesses necessarily. So I'm gonna try and share my screen now and give everyone um, some sort of rundown of the um, pr primary macro level results that we do. We poll uh, around 100 firms uh, this year um, across um, a range of revenue um, points. So we've got a pretty good understanding of the, of the market. It's a pretty reasonable sample uh, we feel to get for that. Um, and we, um, we tend to look at the top of the research uh, around some key areas to do with asking questions around what technologies are really going to have a big effect uh, on law firms in terms of their competitiveness and what technologies are going to have a, an effect on law firms around their efficiency um, in terms of asking what people feel is going to have that effect. Um, and then we, then we try to bring those together and show, well, what technologies are going to have you know, sort of are going to be good bets. They could be, um, from the law firm's perspective, this tends to be whether they're a good buy, are they going to deliver bang for buck across both of those areas, what have you. Now, obviously, we have to caveat 
um, a lot of the things that we're about to say um, in light of the current um, COVID-19 um, sort of lockdown uh, uh, and uh, pandemic that um, a lot of, I, as a sort of, as, as well journalist, I'm most, I'm most interested in how, it's, how this is going to change everything we've just come up with, um, but um, we're going to hopefully discuss that later. So this was carried out uh, at the very end of 2019 uh, and published in February. Um, so, so you understand that. So when we talk about this competitiveness and efficiency side of things, um, what we, uh, when we bring them together, uh, as you can see on on this uh, on this plot, that this diagonal line is kind of the intersection between um, people mentioning um, the these technologies. In a sense, if they were if it was on the line, it would be they would mentioning them equally in, in equal numbers for um, competitiveness uh, effect and efficiency effect. So we kind of like try to get where's the where's the, where are the biggest numbers here, and the biggest trends that we kind of we we get out of this question set um, in in the last research would be um, in the SME firms case management and case management integration and updates people saying they want um, they might feel like looking for more sophistication from their CMS can they get more integration for it can they get something out of the integrations of third-party systems and what have you um, and client facing technology including portals now the case management is up we've been doing uh, by the way we've been doing this research now for something like eight years um, nine years across the whole of market. So um, you know, we, we, I've watched uh, case management is always pretty high um, in the SME law firm world, but it's particularly high this year. Client facing technology, including portals, for example, allow putting documents out on the internet um, to your audience, allowing for documents to be passed backwards and forwards from the client side, for example. Um, that's much higher than it has been in, in previous years. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Agile mobile working um, has also was was named in November, December last year as being very, very important. Um, if you ask someone now, of course, this would be off the scale. Um, but it's interesting that we and we'll, we'll talk about that. It's interesting that the firms were already starting to say that this was going to become a, a pretty a primary driver uh, and automating service delivery and workflow. Um, and that's where that down in the um, left hand side, you've got process automation, including RPA, robotic process automation as being another major factor. There is the, the dreaded AI phrase in there as well, um, but um, we at LPM tend to um, look at any firm that, anyone who says AI probably doesn't necessarily know what technologies lie within that, but they have a sense that the technologies that may lie within AI, as far as they understand them, will have a profound effect uh, on legal business. And I think that we would, in an incredibly high level way, agree with that but it, it really does depend on how you're going to see it um we when you dive down into the the smaller number of mentions uh, for different areas these are all free text responses by the way that we bucket up so we tend to we don't suggest things in this area of the survey um the what's really interesting is what we look at over the years which ones pop in and out of these of these of these of this lower end of the box so they tend to be things that are coming in or growing that might be important later and some of the stuff that's really important for me is just an overall mentions of automation and growing uh, if you combine that with the process automation side of things then it becomes an even bigger number so that's kind of really important for uh, SME firms now um, data analytics including fee earner dashboards um, that's kind of one of the rising stars there smack in the middle of competitiveness and efficiency and I fully expect to see that growing because um, we'll hopefully talk about a bit about in our session around why it's going to be really important to be able to analyze data and MI data management information in the firm to understand where things are going because things are going to be very very testing um, and one of the things that I thought would bring out is compliance technology because Obviously, compliance technology drives consistency across the firm. It reduces risk, um, and it can also, um, you know, allow the firm to bring in more work or process more work um, in a scalable manner. So that's kind of I think that's going to be very important. And already is in larger law firms that is a, a pretty major deal. So we want lots more law firms to be to be looking at that and trying to learn some learn from it. There are other very interesting areas like machine learning coming through there and people naming machine learning, which is one of the key AI technologies, um, is a really interesting point. When we're in our research for larger law, um, machine learning is quite well mentioned now and it shows the market is understanding the technology sets that actually lie within this kind of phrase of AI, which doesn't necessarily mean very much. So we also um, try and analyze 
summarise uh, or get some understanding of what, what the SME law market that we um, that we speak to, um, it, how they see the competitive landscape, what they see the threats are, because we always align the idea of, well, if you're going to spend money on stuff, you should be spending money on things that will help you um, respond to market uh, pressures. And so um, when we, we ask this question for quite a few years now, so we've watched these things move around, um, and we do ask the question, what kind of business is your firm's biggest commercial threat or competitor over the next five years? And we've, um, you know, these, these have moved around quite a bit. Um, the last a few years ago, it would have been, the top numbers would have been the standard competition, which is firms just like mine already in our geographies. And then you would have had firms like mine coming into our geographies. And then what's actually happened is that these other, this set of three that I've boxed out here, um, which are bigger firms than mine, online businesses that don't have physical offices, and legal tech-based new businesses, which we did ask this year what, what people meant by that, but I'm not going to get into that because that's a bunch of open responses. These are the, those, are the, those are the next three responses down. Now, until COVID, what I was, when I was presenting this data, I was always to say that the really interesting thing about this is for um, the SME legal market, which is by and large a kind of more local, regional um a territorial kind of business um obviously there are lots of exceptions to that the what that what this means to those that to them is that the next three threats down are non-geographical threat they're either bigger firms coming in and they don't necessarily have to be in the same geography or they can sit up there but they can deliver it in lots of ways and the next two down which kind of are the same thing really um when you see underneath it are completely virtual now, considering where we are now, um, post, you know, sort of all middle of COVID, this is going to be even more incredibly important. So small of SME firms are now facing um, the standard competition and then all the other competition is non-geographic to that and it's pretty virtual as well. So firms that are set up to be more virtual and to reach out beyond their geography are going to be the best place to compete um, with, with, the, um, with the competition as placed. Okay, just quickly onto the notion of you know that technology back into you know how are law firms going to be able to do this? This is another problem, of course, in a in a, in a compressed market now. You know what money you're going to be able to spend? Well, that's going to be problematic. But um, you've even before this situation, we've been tracking these numbers across the SME market and big law for like eight, nine, ten years, uh, especially on big law side. And the average kind of amount of money that a law firm spends on IT in total. Um, which includes staff, I think we asked this right this time to make sure we knew what we we're doing, um, is 5%. That 5% hasn't moved for, well, since we've been doing it, to be honest. Um, so it's always been 5%. 5% is the Gartner average for professional services um, and it hasn't been, really been touched around. And we also ask how much of that budget gets spent on new things like trying out software, creating solutions or apps or client-facing systems. If you remember, client-facing systems was an important part of what's going to have an effect on competitiveness and efficiency and um, from our earlier slide it's about 10 percent of that now you've got about 10 percent on average of five percent of if it's a business that's turning over sort of three to five million you're not got a lot of money to spend on anything new and you're not and you're probably keeping you're probably spending lights on money in technology anyway so there's not a lot going on here and there's a, it, it, the law firms are, are that are not committed to spending on IT to try to uh, efficiency their way out of some of these problems. Uh, I, I mean, I would suspect are going to be in some kind of trouble for lots of reasons and that's just one of them. And just to, to wrap that up, we actually ask, you know, is it, do you, are you, uh, do you understand that, um, that you're, you know, that it's, what do you think uh, the law firm is doing? Is it spending enough on, um, uh, on new or non-business as usual technology um, and we've got half of our respondents say no uh, another third of the respondents say not sure which I always count as kind of no um, with only a very small proportion of people saying yes which probably relates in some sense to some of these numbers in terms of the firms that are spending more than the average um, so the market knows it's not spending enough um, it isn't really spending enough on IT to, to, be, to be competitive. We understand what the areas of, of, of technology the market thinks it needs to have as competitive uh, and to make it more efficient. And, and boy, is it going to need to do both of those things uh, in the next 18 months. So over to Joe for that after that canter through our research. 
Thanks, Rupert. And, and, and a really, really interesting. And as I say, you've got a much bigger set of, uh, of notes that you can that you can give people. Um, one of the key things that I took from from reading your report in in, in detail was obviously what you've summarised there in terms of people spending money on the uh, secure consumer uh, portals, the automation technology facilitating remote working, which obviously is really even more important today than it was three months ago. Um, <clears throat> When I read through the report, though, a lot of people were saying we're going to address those issues over the course of the next three to five years. So how uh, how do you think they are going to be prepared to be able to cope with the fact that they now need to do that probably over the course of the next six to 12 months, given what's going on in the market? Uh, so it is a really so when we when we asked people, that's right about. Our flat, um, when we ask questions that relate to the world of um, sort of more distributed working is how we would kind of see it and um, we asked a set of questions in the research around that um, they range from the percentage of people who um, currently work from home in the business how much how many people they would like to work be able to work from enable to work from home whether the law firms have more people than they have desks for them to sit at uh, and, where, and whether which systems they think are going to be in the cloud over the next three to five years. And we kind of bring all those things together to understand how kind of where the market is going and how, how cloudy and virtual it's, it's ready to be. Um, that's true that we do talk about this cloud vision um, over three to five years. That's mainly because we've already are, always asked them that way. So you kind of have to apples for apples over the years. Um, and uh, I, I certainly wasn't expecting a pandemic. So when we were asked it, otherwise I could have asked in the next 12 months. And it would have been amazing to ask if you, in the next 12 months, because this would have been really, really different. Um, and in fact, we do have one answer about the next 12 months, but that's usually about office moves. What's really interesting in terms of the answers on how ready are they? Well, intriguingly, one of the really big problems that any business, you know, law firm or not, would have around this is the you know what's it what what property is it in for like you know is it in an, is it on a lease that it can't get out of um that lease the when law firms go through a lease up or any business code but we've been tracking this across all law firm sizes you know the change to making smaller office space and getting more people to be remote and that stuff like that happens pretty much at a lease point uh, when people are moving so if that's not happening in the next 12 months and the business can't do something with its landlord then it's not going to change the notion of its footprint it can do lots of other things, but it's not going to it's not going to fundamentally reduce that cost. If you have people working from home, for example, one day a week, your your per desk cost doesn't change a heck of a lot either. So you're not going to be able to, sh to change that cost base that radically by doing some of these things in the near term. So in terms of how ready they are to do it now, we do understand that um, we the percentage of you know, that, that firms don't have anywhere near only the larger firms in the SME market. So those over 10 million revenue answered that. Um, I'll try to um, I'll try to share this actually once more so we can um, um, so I can sort of demonstrate what I mean. So when we ask people what percentage of people in your firm regularly work from home, um, which is the top chart here, <clears throat> the larger firms, 10 million over, basically said they had about a quarter to nearly a third of people regularly working from home. Um, and when we asked them how, what percentage of the workforce would they like to enable to regularly work from home, the numbers are pretty big. And so we look at this chart data overall and say, look, there's a lot, you know, at the time when we did this, there's a lot of appetite uh, and intent uh, in amongst law firms. Um, so we just, to be clear, we poll um, practice directors, practice managers, managing partners, uh, and and other kind of influencers. If there's IT managers in the firm, we might ask them instead. Um, and you know, their response is ultimately, if you look at the average from 15 to 32, we we translate this as saying that you know SME law firms would like to double the number of people they're enabled to work from home. This is still half what a big law company big law would say they would say they, they're currently like 30 to 40 percent and then 70 to 80 percent in terms of their their difference now um so if you look at this chart on its own they're not terribly ready <laughs> it, would, it would say that only you know most firms haven't got did not have enough people working from home to really have an, a handle on on what that would and what that would entail we also ask how many firms have significantly more people than they have desks for them to sit at? Very few. And 
the, the time scale over they might move to this point where you've got more people than desks, the hot desk, free desk world um, is relatively long. Now, this probably hasn't, won't, won't change because the lease problems, as I said, that's a, that's a standard longer problem. But this stuff around how many people working from home, it'd be, I'd be fat, I can't wait to do the research back, but I just don't, they weren't terribly ready. Smaller firms, however, in our experience, have an upside in the sense that you know you're, the smaller you are the more you can readily sort of shift position um, and the bigger firms have to do that with a massive organizational change um, journey so there's there's a possibility to make changes now just quickly the reason how ready are they smaller firms have um, overall in our in our experience of running this research for uh, a number of years ha are, have tended to be more cloud friendly so they're the ones that have bought into cloud services um, and, and cloud applications um, because they've got less legacy IT, they, they, they have ex they, they've grown and expanded um, compared to big law. So actually I would say that in terms of being able to get on the cloud and, and buy into systems on the cloud, uh, and we also know from our connections over in the cloud community and the managed service provider community that they're, they're busy as heck right now so i actually think they, they were they were they were if they knew what they were doing quite ready to jump things into the cloud but the the downside is you know you can you can get everyone working from home we know that actually in lots of finance departments they've had people who had to take desktops home check printers home i mean that's mad so you know you've got real problems with with how business services run but getting a lot of people to work in from home is probably easier than dealing with the infrastructural problems and dangers that have come from being part of that. Yeah, no, that's really interesting as well. I mean, I think, uh, and, 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 and when we went through the process at TM of, of moving everybody off site um, a number of weeks ago, um, there were parts of that process that hadn't been fully tested. Most of our business could be moved off site and had been, had been fully tested, but there were parts that hadn't been. And I was actually positively surprised and, and pleasantly surprised, I have to say, how quick uh, and, and easy ultimately it was to, to deal with those, those challenges. I guess the, the thing that's really interesting is when I look at the market dynamic over the course of the next uh, 12 months, uh, you, we're clearly in a period where the market is declining rapidly. Um, so we're seeing volumes of stuff going down. There's still a true, but it's very much on its way down. Um, and we are projecting that, uh, certainly in the conveyancing space, that activity is going to be um, quite subdued now, probably for, well, the rest of Q2 and, 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 and most of Q3 as well. Um, and that's even on a, on a, on a reasonable uh, assumption about our, our, our return to normal from the situation we're in at the moment. Then we're also looking forward and we're saying, okay, well, actually, we think there's a, a stack of pent up demand for stuff. Um, that goes back to Brexit, that goes back to what we started to be released at the start of this year, what's happened now, but also the fact that everybody's cooped up at home may well be encouraging people thinking about doing something different uh, in the future. So we're expecting there to be quite a significant surge in activity in 2021. Now that creates quite a lot of turbulence in the market in terms of uh, a, you know, downward uh, trend followed by rapid upward trend, and that's not normally what uh, many industries, but particularly law firms, have been used to dealing with um, over that time. So, I, I guess my sort of question is: What are the the what are the biggest challenges that we see to firms' ability to manage their business and to deliver the levels of customer service that they need to deliver in that time, so that come 2021, they're able to you know reap what will hopefully be a positive year. And, and uh, before that, survive what's going to be a fairly terrible 2020. Well, I mean, it's, it's a good point. I mean, it's what's, what's really strange, obviously, is that the, the true art, I mean, obviously, the biggest art, the biggest answer for that has got, you know, nothing to do with, with technology. It's going to be their biggest, obviously, the biggest problem is going to be, um, you know, cash flow. Um, and law firms are pretty shocking at, at retained earnings. Um, it's, you know, those ones that are LLPs. Um, certainly don't seem to do terribly well at it um, and so you you know it's what's worrying for for us is law firms going into a really significant rapid downturn in businesses that don't really have a float um, and um, and also haven't traditionally been terribly good at um, sort of 
good financial analytics and um, cash flow forecasting. Uh, and I'm being very broad brush. I'm sure there are lots and lots of firms that are really good at that. Um, but in our experience, it's not, it's not been great um, in quite a lot of firms. Now, if you don't know where you are uh, and, uh, and, you, and your, your management information isn't great, um, or you've got people in the business who are running it who don't really understand it or don't want to, let's say, um, then you're really going to be, this is going to be a real struggle. Um, and I think even if you do, it's going to be a terrible struggle. So the way that we would see it is that obviously lots of law firms are going to be doing furloughing. They'll be, you know, most likely getting a heck of a lot of layoffs as soon as the pipeline starts to fall off. Um, and that may well happen outside of the furlough period, which is going to be even more, 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 more scary, really. Um, because the government obviously can't carry it on um, forever. Um, but the, and so one of the things I think is going to be really interesting is this, can law firms, um, you know, put some work into um, automation so that when the market, and we're all going to cross our fingers and assume that it does pick up again, um, that they are able to deal with the workload ahead of hiring or restaffing uh, and I think that that's one of the things that's going to be really interesting about the possibilities of process automation for example um, across the business can you can you do more automation can you get more done with fewer people um, and use this time to um, obviously going to be a very tricky time to invest now I think what will be what will be very interesting is how many providers out there are going to um, work with law firms to deliver the abilities now and take a punt and charge later. Um, and I, you know, I would be very interested to see, you know, vendors who would be prepared to help law firms get ready um, for this ability to make more. Because obviously, the sooner they can be making money, or, or when the pipeline starts to come back again, the faster they can rehire. So there's not only an employment, but a sort of a moral imperative, really, to get old firms ready. Uh, and they can, as soon as they can spin back up, the sooner people can be rehired. And in fact, not doing it and saving things back is actually going to be worse um, because they're not going to be able to rehire back. So two of the things that we think from the research are going to be terribly important is really thinking about how you're going to automate the business enough in terms of the, the how you get work gets done so that you can deliver work as you go forward with with fewer people um how can you and do that and do that well um but also one of the things that the law firms need to do better really is um financial analytics and pricing uh, pricing and scoping like one of the things that they don't do very well is you know work out how much work costs to do um, and what it should be priced at uh, some some are brilliant uh, some are less so um and because this is going to have a real if you've got no cash you've got a real cash flow problem and you're real you're in the doldrums um, um in, a, in a market that's really bad getting getting stuff wrong like what it's going to cost you to do is it could be really really bad um and so um we did just want to show, show you something that um um which you know, I find almost, you know, sort of comic relief, um, really, um, is if I can try and find this, uh, where are we now? So we, ask, uh, we asked a question of which, which single practice work area in your firm is best at scoping or pricing for profitability um, and conveyancing um, commercial residential came up trumps there and um, so you would look at that and go well well done convincing uh, you've done you've done brilliantly um but unfortunately we also asked people what was what single practice area in your firm is worst at price scoping and pricing so uh, and it's a slightly higher number who say worse and of course what this means is that you know 20 20 22 percent of the audience thought their convincing areas were amazing um and 31 percent of our audience thought their convincing areas were absolutely terrible and so what this means is that there's obviously a lot of mixed opinions on who's pretty bad but if you look at who's pretty bad in this kind of who's which where is the worst um you know family not great not a great generator really um by and large um conveyancing um you know depending it's probably not it's not a high margin um so you're you're what you're looking at is areas where litigation better because it should be higher margin but if you've got low margin low margin high volume or just low margin areas of work um, in this map where you're not great at scoping and pricing 
and you're in an area where when you get stuff wrong you're going to take a bath where write-offs are not going to not going to be great fun uh through this through this period then you you really should be now focusing on you know how can we get better at making sure that we that we make money on the work that we do there isn't going to be any wiggle room so we would we really think that law firms should be thinking about these kind of how 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 to how to ex, how to eke out those margins and how to find ways to you know to pr project better um, what you know how they're going to make money from every piece of work they do especially conveyancing heavy businesses that's really got to happen okay brilliant listen i, I think we we've barely scratched the surface actually really but i think we could go on a lot longer but these sessions are designed to be brief um, we, we have come to now to 11.30, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it to a close. Um, can I thank you, however, Rupert, please, for your times and thoughts. They were really, really interesting, much appreciated. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, I'm sure they can find you on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> if, if, if they want to email you, your email address is? Uh, my email address is rupertw at lpmmag.co.uk. Brilliant. But uh, as I say, if, 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 if you've missed that, then, uh, then let us know and we'll be able to share that, of course. Thank you to everybody who's joined us. Really, really appreciate that. Um, please remember that if you missed anything of this, it will be on the YouTube channel. Um, so that, that should be up in, within the next day or so. Um, and of course, that's also where you can see all of the other previous uh, broadcasts that I mentioned pre uh, before. So that's it for today. Uh, please do remember to like TMTV. Um, and we will send you details of our future events to make sure that you get included uh, in that. So just for now, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us. That's TMTV. Over and out. Thank you.